Now, in 2017, the Me Too movement began to spread virally as a hashtag uh, campaign on social media. Now, let me uh, briefly introduce Professor Basu. Professor Basu uh, is uh, affiliated to uh, the departments of Gender and Women's Studies and Anthropology, uh, University of Kentucky. She is also a member of the Committee on Social Theory at this university. She has an interdisciplinary PhD from Ohio State University in Cultural Studies, Anthropology, and Women's Studies. Yes. And her teaching, research, and community work interests include global feminisms, law, gender-based violence, social movements, methodologies, and masculinities. She is the author of the monographs, The Trouble with Marriage, Feminists Confront Law and Violence in India. This, this, uh, this, this was published in 2015 by University of California Press. She comes to take her rights, Indian Women, Property and Proprietor. This was published in 1999 by Sunny Press. She is the editor of Dowry and Inheritance, published by Women Unlimited in 2005, and co-editor with Lucinda Ramberg of Conjugality Unbound, Sexual Economy and the Marital Form in India, again uh, published by Women Unlimited in 2014. Some recent articles on masculinity, law, marriage, and violence appear in anthologies. Uh, some of her recent articles on masculinity, law, marriage, and violence appear in anthologies, including 50th anniversary commemorative volume of contributions to Indian sociology. Uh, this was uh, published in 2019. Men and Feminism in India, 2018. Sexuality Studies, Oxford India Studies in Contemporary Society, uh, 2013. New South Asian Feminisms, Paradoxes and Possibilities, 2012. And the journals Feminist Anthropology, QED, Journal of Indian Law and Society, Canadian Journal of Women and Law, and Economic and Political Weekly. Professor Bas, uh, Professor Bas, too, has written for the Miss Magazine blog, India Today, Times of India, and Kafila, participated in the UN expert group meeting on family policy development achievements and challenges, and worked with a number of NGOs in India and the US that focus on law and gender-based violence. She is working on a monograph about the, uh, about the anti feminist men's rights movements in India following a 2013 14 Fulbright Fellowship to conduct fieldwork uh, with MRAs across Indian cities. And presently, in the midst of a new fieldwork project uh, uh, to interview women working as private detectives in India. Uh, Okay, she would dearly love to hear from folks who know of uh, anyone. Uh, so uh, now I would request uh, our co-convener, Dr. Bhashwati Chatterjee, to introduce Dr. Dev Dutta Choudhury to the audience. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Aparna. Uh, once again, I uh, thank Professor Shimutri Bashu uh, for readily agreeing to be the uh, to be the speaker of today's webinar. Thank you, Shimutri. And uh, our heartfelt thanks to Devdatta uh, for agreeing to chair the session in such a short notice. Uh, so thank you all. And uh, Women's History Conclave has a tagline, uh, Women in History, Women Make History. So the recent hashtag MeToo movement uh, is a making of history in process. So today we will learn about it from our esteemed speaker. And now let me introduce uh, today's chairperson, Devdatta Choudhury. Dr. Devdatta Choudhury is Assistant Professor in Gender Studies at Center for Social, uh, Social Studies in 
Calcutta. Uh, research interests include gender and law, border migration partition studies, especially in the context of South Asia. She is currently researching on two areas of inquiry. One, women-led grassroots level legal advocacy mechanisms in India as a potential model for alternate dispute resolution and as a feminist intervention into legal jurisprudence. And number two, the gendering higher education in the context of gender sensitization mechanisms and practices in Indian higher education institutions. Her monograph titled Identities and Experiences at the India-Bangladesh Border, A Crisis of Belonging, has uh, been published by Rutledge in two, uh, 2018. She has published with national and international journals and has contributed to a number of edited volumes and continues to do so. Now the floor is yours, Devdatta. Thank you so, so much. And thank you, Professor uh, Bandupadha and Professor Chatterjee for uh, honoring me with this opportunity to chair Professor Basu's talk. Uh, uh, Professor Srimoti Basu's work, as we uh, all know, has delved into extremely um, pressing yet complex spaces and mechanisms of feminist reforms, especially in the context of violence and property questions within marital forms in India. Uh, she's an ethnographer par excellence and commits herself to the difficult job of studying fields and sites which are often at odds with her own feminist politics as a neutral observer and a non-judgmental researcher. Uh, and this has produced some of her best research works in recent times, as uh, Apunadi mentioned, on men's rights movement, a project she undertook at the risk of, in her own own words, losing feminist friends and undermining feminist achievements and validating masculinist cries of backlash. Uh, the dilemmas associated with ethnographic research at large, the delusion of alliance and the moments of betrayal that Kamala Vishweshwaran talks characteristic of feminist ethnography uh, come through in very honest expressions of concerns and narratives of Professor Basu's experience as a feminist ethnographer trying to make sense of the many we weird ways by which law and jurisprudence is entangled with questions of gender, power, and rights. We look forward to what I'm sure uh, will be a, a very thought-provoking talk. I welcome Professor Basu once again and leave the stage, so to say, uh, for her to begin her talk. Professor Basu. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out on Holy Evening, first of all. Um, and thank you so much to uh, Hashati and uh, Aparna for inviting me to speak at the Women's History Conclave, where I, you know, I just coincidentally met them for two minutes at Terry Fox's house, and I've been following it since, and looking at what great talks you've done. Um, and thank you, Devlata, for that very, very um, generous and very, uh, I think, um, uh, a, a very good description of uh, some of the things I've tried to do, but uh, you know, I gave Hachati a set of topics, and she did not pick any of the ethnography ones. So um, <laughs> she picked actually the most kind of um, uh, difficult, or or uh, but you know, it goes to these questions of uh, difficult feminist politics, I think, um, which I've been trying to go after. So. Um, so I don't know that, you know, I mean, I, I wanted to start out by saying that um, it's a thing I'm struggling with too, you, we are all struggling with it, you know, we're trying to understand what it is. And so I um, offer my talk as a um, way for us to maybe think together, you know, of uh, what this movement is. So I'm, I'm mostly going to read with some things and we are all experimenting with this PowerPoint format. Let's see how it goes. So, um, um, and I want to start in a uh, 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 unusual place, you know, as scholars of gender-based violence, we are um, often tend to set personal stories aside from fieldwork, even though we know that our professional curiosities are uh, profoundly shaped by um, where we're from, right? So, uh, 
you know, but I can't think of me too without feeling sort of inundated um, by experience uh, of uh, remembering the many ways that um, our lives constitute our uh, fields as uh, ethnographers and as feminist scholars. So um, um, I offered this essay as in a couple of ways. One, um, I was very nervous reading the word history in the title. Um, but I think I offer this in the way that, you know, Mrinali Sinha um, talks about uh, a history of the present. So it is a history of the present for us to think about and reflect on. Um, and a set of political dilemmas that arise from such histories. Second, um, it is an exercise of thinking with feminism, right? including, um, Devdatta was just talking about um, feminist methodologies, so including what I think are, you know, sort of vulnerabilities or uh, what we would call reflexibility, reflexivity or doubt we see as um, central to uh, feminist methodology. And um, I'm just, I am, you know, thinking about this through, there's a number of examples from the U.S. that I thought you would be interested in, interspersed with uh, some of the events in India. So um, um, in the first section, um, so I'm going to, okay, here it goes. Let's see how this goes. Did it change it? Oh, good. So um, this is Tarana Burke, of course. And uh, so my talk is kind of loosely structured around these three topics, law and sex and feminism, but I start with a couple of sections. Uh, one about my very, uh, like everybody's, taken by surprise sort of personal moment. And um, second by a, a sort of broadening out into what some of the things we think the movement might be doing. Um, I think I have to go back to the PowerPoint each time to do this. Can you all still see me? Will somebody unmute and tell me, can you see me if I'm still at the PowerPoint? Yes, we can see you. We can see you. Very good. So then I will just yes. stay at the bottom. Still good? Yes. Yes. It's good. It's okay. Good? Okay. All right. So um here we are so october 2017 seems a long way away i was just looking for this um uh, facebook post to share it with you all and i realized how much has happened since then in all of our lives so it seems a very far very far away but um it was early in the season of me too avowals but you know i am always far behind on social media so um like so many others i know across the world i also joined in with you know, wistful solidarity um, to say, I'm going to let you read this, and I'll read it a little bit with you. But of course, me too. Uh, I say I usually avoid all like post X in solidarity requests, right, which we get every day for diseases, causes, etc. My standouts include neighbor with a peeing fetish, math tutor, guy seeking German speaking helpers for an event which turned out to be female bodies handing out flyers, guy who followed us to our high school pretending he was having a painful period. I, I should say I see at least one of my um, school classmates here. So anyone who has walked to South Point uh, will know what I'm talking about. Uh, not to mention innumerable buses and markets and creepy family, friends and relatives. In fact, I often think of the day in class eight when we girls had a group epiphany of Me Too. Samina, who had the original post. I too have been thinking about how these histories shape our work on gender-based violence. So um, that uh, phrase, you know, I just said wistful solidarity, um, which I used to describe this post, seems to include a sort of uh, resigned shrug at the omnipresence of, you know, rape culture in this paragraph, um, steeped in memories of uh, undeserved guilt and shame at the public recognition of our sexual bodies our bravado at having uh, navigated and survived daily creeps and, you know, decades of, you know, kind of breezy laughter that um, mark our sarcastic recognition of all these semi realities. So it's a kind of, it's 
it reads to me now as a kind of catharsis of uh, a group catharsis of ridicule. Um, and I notice how, you know, this little paragraph could have been interminable and that I seem to have picked some, uh, you know, so particularly surreal moments that uh, stand out to me with that, you know, you know, it just for narrative punch as we do on Facebook. So I also think how um, large these moments loomed at the time, you know, in a daily way, in uh, how it shaped our everyday mobility, it constituted our sexual selves, our growing sexual selves. Um, yet they now this sounds inappropriately loud and privileged to me when I see them in the framework of other traumas, right? Whether uh, many of us with this latter knowledge of a really close friend's um, silent struggles with incest from a famous father or my own academic work with legal cases, you know, I often think that for those of us who work on uh, rape and sexual assault, um, Mathura's rape in police custody that precipitated the whole feminist reform of um, Indian rape law stands in a different kind of place than this, right? Um, Bianca Williams, the anthropologist, says of her own reactions, but as I thought, quote, but as I thought about the stories of rape and sexual assault of those closest to me, I wondered if my tame encounters with sexualized violence even counted in comparison to theirs. Um, I too wondered about uh, the voices or stories that happened to be sent to stage. But also I want to point out to you that I am noticing in retrospect uh, that the absences in my post also follow a popular script. If you look at this, uh, you'll see we seek to hold the street and the neighborhood and the workplace to account while um, remarking little on family and kin, which is, you know, as we know, a primary site of violence. Uh, it's worth noting in that in my in my experience, demarcates moments of, you know, I, I would say caste and class privilege, you know, the school uniform, the home tutor, foreign language classes, you know, homes with private spaces, and it breezily admits that sexual harassment is a ubiquitous form of either exercising power or leveling power. So um, <laughs> I actually thought, Bhashati, that Holi uh, is a very appropriate <laughs> time for this talk because, uh, you know, for uh, in growing up as women around the space, it certainly is, um, uh, sort of fused with an idea of gender-based violence for that. So, yes. uh, um, Rebecca Traister, uh, the journalist, has, um, I just want to show you how beautiful the cover of that article is. Um, so she too had narrated, you know, in, in narrating this fam familiar litany of experiences that she chose not to pursue formally, um, raises a similar doubt about the enormity of her own experience. So many of us, you know, were like, do, do I, should I even be speaking up here? Kind of. But she reminds us that the pernicious ubiquity of sexual harassment, you know, how much there is and how, how much it is all around us, infects us all. And hence that every iteration of Me Too is an acknowledgement of that infection, right? Um, here's what she says. So no. I was never sexually harassed, but the stink got on me anyway. I was implicated. We all are. Our professional contributions weighed on scales of fuckability and willingness to go along, to be good sports, to not be humorless goals or office organs. Our achievements chalked up to male affiliation. We can rebuff the harasser. We can choose not to fuck the boss. But in a world where men hold inordinate power, we are still in bed with the guy. So it's, you know, uh, it's a thinking about our sort of not just willing complicity, but an inability to get out of that complicity. So um, I also, you know, experience, so uh, to uh, reflect on this whole thing, I experienced Me Too kind of stereophonically, right? Both through the resonances of such embodied experiences that demonstrate um, how sexuality and power and violence in the street and home and workplace, as to be all, um, and through the lens of my, you know, um, skill sets and from my work on gender and violence and social movements, I still think that when it comes to this topic, the former leads to by my post and others in those early days of the hashtag was inspired by solidarity with a group consciousness raising wave with little thought to um, concrete questions of um, accountability, let alone, you know, concerns with the legal or car in, um, legal carceral 
it was unclear who could be held at, in that early time right it was unclear who could be held accountable for what what law um, could be pertinent and what would be gained or what would be lost in uh, public accounts but soon uh, my uh, kind of professional academic intellectual preoccupations were on high alert right so um, <laughs> Oprana and uh, Devata really mentioned the fact that I work on the legacies of feminist legal reform, right? What happens to legal reforms after they put forward, whether around the law of property or dowry or divorce or rape or domestic violence. That is, I work on the transformations and failures that arise from um, such reforms being institutionalized. So this makes me all too well attuned to uh, the ambiguities of putting stock in law, putting stock in legal solutions, right? Um, I'll talk much more about this later. So I have found it most useful to think about law as one of the cultural negotiations, one of the things that exists, right? Uh, that complaints and claims show us how to move around socioeconomic relations. Um, primarily, I looked at the relationship between criminal and civil law in marriage. Um, so I've learned to be skeptical of uh, relying on legal solutions while aware that uh, of the strategic significance of bringing an issue to legal notice. You know, so um, <laughs> for those of you who teach any part of law and law society studies, right, it often seems that we are always in space. We're always like law is bad, law has gaps, but we need law. So uh, that's kind of where this is. So. Um, as gender-based violence has become a globally recognized category of awareness and governance, uh, you know, it's uh, become useful. People know what it is, right? Um, so, um, Sally Mary used this word vernacularized. So we sort of have a structure of global gender-based violence, and we also have a structure of vernacularization. Uh, I, she would suggest that in each context we look at it in that particular history. So uh, it's so we have that we, we are able to access that. It's become possible to use it as an instrument of negotiating through law, right? In India, certainly. But that is not without you know major kinds of warning signs. So putting these two parts of my you know personal and my research interests together. Uh, in in this talk, I want to think about whether Me Too is a moment or a movement or a modality, as I said, in the, um, as I hinted in the uh, title. And I'm doing it through those three modes I mentioned, law and sex and feminism. And just to, um, again, I haven't decided, but I think I argue that Me Too uh, is, I argue for me to being an expression of intersectional issues of sex, consent, and power in the shadow of law. We can talk more about the shadow of law. So uh, my first section, which describes the movement, is called a name, a wave, or a whimper. Uh, so our understandings of the scope and import of Me Too are still uh, kind of inchoate, right? We all, we are not quite sure. It's incomplete. What is it, right? Uh, here are some suggestions. Is Me Too an uncoordinated set of individual pushbacks with domino effects? Is it a transnational social movement across various professions and nations? Is it a critique of seemingly neutral performance expectations in education or jobs? Or is it an indictment of the shortcomings of feminist interventions in law? So uh, every piece written on Me Too seems to seize on a kind of different part of this question, right? So one of the difficulties is that we're talking about a movement that has, you know, all is taking up all these questions and has all these dimensions. So um, I'm going to talk now about, it, it, following that, about the varied uh, ways in which feminists have approached the question. So first, some writers are really <clears throat> excited and buoyed by, by the fact that it is uncoordinated, right? That it is disjointed. Um, and they're interested in the affective passion of the movement. They welcome the absence of a singular uh, um, organizing structure or a manifesto of demands. Uh, so Supriya Nair uh, wrote this piece where she deems that the very essence of Me Too is to be broadly revolutionary rather than narrowly legalistic. In her words, uh, Me Too isn't cut and dried and can't be. 
it was never simply about finding legal recourse. From the beginning, it has concerned itself with exposing a social fault line. The point is to lay bare the social conditions. Um, <clears throat> the point is to lay bare the social conditions that rendered these misdemeanors trivial, even acceptable. Uh, even though they hurt and degrade their victims. So she feels that the point is that it's like each person uh, experiences it in a uh, certain way and brings it together. Right? Jaffe, in similar vein, it's a longer quote, um, argues for this movement as an organic critique, a critique of the failure of law and state, a kind of collective coming to voice. Uh, she says, uh, the structures of the legal system and the workplace did not change. Instead, tens of thousands of women said, yes, me too. Then, rather than wait for men to absorb that knowledge and decide whether to change or not, they started naming names um, and making lists and talking to each other. That's how organizing starts, after all. It starts with people talking about the conditions of their lives, realizing that they are common and that they want them to change. It starts with enough people joining the conversation that they begin to believe that they can win. So in these accounts, to, uh, to use Supriyanaya's language, Me Too is anarchic, which she sees as a positive thing, aggregative, you know, put together with multiple things. Uh, powerful because of its metonymic, that is its associational power. Um, some iterations of Me Too reflect this perspective in the ways that they address local specificities and call out every silences around work and space and body and violence. Um, so some people, including Kaderi, um, characterize Me Too as a transnational feminist movement. Uh, so Kaderi dismisses critiques of it as neoliberal or individualistic, right? Or it might be that, but it's primary, uh, together with the, the primary importance is that it is a part of histories of feminist consciousness raising movements in various countries from um, an earlier history of that movement. So uh, as opposed to this sort of buoyant feeling like this is what is it, it's coming into form, it's a, it's a form of resistance. Against this, we have feminist skepticism, almost as prevalent as such buoyant faith. Uh, uh, and people are wary, the reasons for being wary include whether this is just a media fashion, um, whether it limits the forms of violence that we look at, that we only look at certain kinds of violence, and whether it is all about individual remedy and not more of a social movement. So uh, Zarkov and Davis say that they do not see that things, quote, that they do not see that things have changed for the better since the 1970s regarding the voyeuristic, sexist, and misogynist nature of our societies. Um, uh, pointing to, we all know this is true, right? The enduring difficulties of victims with uh, prosecution, new law, whether or not there are new laws. So when people go to court, it's still a difficult place, very difficult place. So they unfavorably contrast the prominence of rich, powerful, and by, uh, famous celebrities and their social media following in the present moment with the mass collective protests of the 70s globally. Um, they're wary of the ways that sensational and sexualized details, you can remember the whole uh, movie industry thing in India, uh, that sensational and sexualized detail eclipses the swath of everyday narratives that people have. So, um, uh, Gil and Ogat similarly critique the exclusions by um, race and uh, gender identity and the great emphasis, the overemphasis on workplace harassment over other forms of privatized violence. But they are also very concerned with how media governs, you know, what we talk about, how media makes us see a certain way. So they say that uh, one of the limitations is concerns the question of whether the movement's popularity and visibility are indeed due to its call for justice or due to the salacious content of the stories it has brought to life. So to put it somewhat crudely, is it sexism or sex? That's all. How should we understand the role of mainstream media that suddenly seems to believe some women after decades of trivializing and undermining? Um, so in contrast to those who you know, really promote the enabling possibilities of this global infection, that it's, uh, it's small, it's getting together, that's what its power is, these scholars emphasize the difficulty of um, bringing to notice uh, nuances that don't catch 
the sensational imagination, right? If it's um, if it's a movie star, that story gets read in a certain different way than uh, regular people. And so the challenges of feminist uh, resistance is setting them to us. So, um, I mean, a, a sort of subset of this point is that, you know, we feel very enthusiastic uh, when we see like kind of the rich and famous, we think they're going to get their comeuppance, but people are also concerned that it may be counterproductive, right? If this often temporary punishment uh, provides a self that stalls more uh, sustained change. So um, this was a retrospective on me too. Any old day from India, obviously, and any old day you can add some more faces to it, right? Um, in these last few months, right, Bishop Franco has uh, been actually, not only is out, is giving uh, kind of advice to the church of how, of, of at church gatherings of how to, uh, you know, how men should comport themselves. Uh, you know, Tarun Tejpal is uh, kind of triumphantly suing for uh, the rights of the accused, etc. So, um, uh, Pellegrini and also Ashwini Tambe, in, in, in thinking about this, articulate a popular feeling that in the US, Tambe writes about uh, uh, Trump's election in the US, that uh, Trump's election whether because of or despite of his totally preordained for consent to sexual behavior, it um, precipitated uh, a social process of women finding voice, right? That um, it precipitated the Me Too movement, Ashwini uh, argues in many ways. Um, Pellegrini calls this a facilitative displacement. Um, but uh, Pellegrini here remains concerned about what comes after me, right? My, me Too and then what? Um, echoing also Tarana Burke also said that, that, um, that the, you know, we read in the media about occasional job losses, a few legal cases, but the worry is that such punitive measures will not result in changing norms of justice or violation and will not help process trauma. So, um, uh, there was this very poignant article in the cut, which is part of the New York Times, called Was It Worth It? Uh, demonstrates it had 25 testimonials about a few months after, about a year after, that those who spoke out now uh, lived with, the, among the people who spoke out, they lived with little improvement and feelings of letdown at best, and danger, harassment, and drastic effects on job stability. Yet. So it's you know not we, we just see a moment of someone taken off to jail, but very often the everyday long term effects are uh, either fleeting or they're they're actually there are actually negative effects on people. So these survivors are keenly aware of how little has shifted, even when they don't second guess their decision to speak out. So they don't regret speaking out necessarily, but um, it's very clear to them what, how little has changed. So. Um, uh, Gia Tolentino argues that the prompt backlash that follows um, victims' avowals uh, reconsolidated and strengthened patriarchal solidarity, right? So I, could, I have a, a from some department, uh, uh, a little, uh, I don't know, stress ball that says, uh, squeeze patriarchy to which, uh, you know, our standard house joke is we say patriarchy bounces back. So Me Too is an example of patriarchy bounces back, right? Um, so Gia Tolentino, I want to show you the cover of that beautiful article. Some of the art that came in on this was really beautiful. Um, and so Tolentino says, this is Kavanaugh is the Supreme Court Justice in the US. It says it will be said that Kavanaugh was confirmed despite the Me Too movement. It would be at least as accurate to say that he was confirmed because of it. Right? This is the backlash part. Women's speech and the fact that we are now listening to it has enraged men in a way that makes them determined to reestablish the long-standing hierarchy of power. So we are likely premature, right? In any of our diagnoses here, at best we are five years old, right? Uh, as we try to analyze this in real time, but. Uh, I think this is a tab, one of the things that really interests me here in part, because as you heard, I'm looking at uh, anti-feminist uh, social movement. 
um, is the role of emotions in social movements, right? What is the role that affect plays? So um, Deborah Gould, who uh, has this very nice book on moving politics, on uh, affect and social movements, um, she studies emotion and politics. So she emphasizes that this infectious trans transmission of energy in the political desire to hear people speak um, is really important, right? Even when it's not clear what horizons are in view. So sometimes social movements are um, are all over the place. People are showing up. It's not like one coordinated strategy. You know, that's what moves things forward later very often. So um, uh, <laughs> make what you will of it, but you could consider the Facebook statistic that 50% uh, of US users were friends with someone who posted a message about their experiences of uh, assault or harassment. And also Facebook said that Facebook and Twitter feeds in Sweden, India, and Japan were rocked for days. Similar posts convey a sense of this vital energy. So Gould contends that it is typical for emergent protest movements to have um, this kind of diffuse but very strong affect um, rather than orchestrated political roles. So as she says, social movements, you can think of social movements as spaces of world making, producing sentiments, ideas, values, and practices, the euphoria of knowing your own and others' capacities and energies. So me too, I thought fits goals uh, I, uh, category really well, both in its enthusiasm for all these pluralities and in, you know, um, in the questions of backlash and in the idea that it seems um, disconnected from each other, but it's uh, it's very passionate. Nonetheless. So we can think that its significance may lie not in the details of outrage or in the details of solutions so much as in the local and global feminist pragmatics of what it means to say no, to say no or to say me too. Uh, so um, as linguistic anthropologist uh, Anna Bell uh, compellingly said, Women are not uh, simply remarking that this is a hard, cold world out there. We are asking you to shut the window and the door too. You have heard our stories and they belong to you too. So um, Babel says you could think of um, Me Too as a whisper campaign among friends, you know, a, fam a familiar device through which many of us survive for a, long, for a very long time. The, uh, familiar device that gives women sustenance and arms the information. Beyond that, she says, the iteration of Me Too has uh, a cumulative, cumulative effect, right? a cumulative excess of effect, uh, mourning, and thus becomes a cry for cultural and structural change. So uh, that's sort of uh, my movement to have my uh, introduction to how we could think about it as a movement. Um, I'm going to talk about these three categories of uh, law, sex, and feminism, starting with law. So the question with law is always, what good is the law? How far can law take us? Uh, as the above account indicates, worries about me too have centered around the thorny question of translating uh, grievances into law and um, the incipient um, uh, contradictions with feminist schools of justice. So, um, pause up here for a second to see you all. Before I go back to that page. Um, in this section, I consider how to think about Me Too within what we call legal pluralism. I see that Devata is also thinking about that in various ways. That is within a socio political space in which people use different things. They use existing laws, other norms, other systems and gaps or contradictions between legal provisions to bargain in the shadow of law, to use Mary's term. So the challenge is to think simultaneously about how law can be an enabling force, right? How it allows you to get to things of how privileged law is in the modern state as a, as a technology with which to do something, but also for us to be cognizant of the heavy force of law and how it can be random or how punishment or jail or hanging is a problematic solution given its disproportionate effect on communities who are marginalized by uh, class or caste or race or citizenship. So uh, the Me Too movement perfectly allows us to consider what bargaining in the shadow of the law means. Accusations, uh, people who have come forward with accusations evoke laws, right? 
uh, they need much better considerations of law and policy, but they also make evident the failures and the limitations of existing laws. On the one hand, we have, you know, rousing cheers and thankfulness for law, um, the presence of laws addressing gender harassment and violence in no small part due to various uh, feminist movements, certainly in India uh, and elsewhere across the world following the UN decade for women. These, the fact that those laws exist facilitate the hearing of grievances. Um, so Catherine McKinnon, as the legal mind who was largely instrumental in formulating sexual harassment as an employment uh, violation, um, I mean, the category kind of comes from her, even though it's been enacted in different ways globally. Uh, she justifiably points out that sexual harassment laws in various countries often put in place as a result of feminist mobilization are an essential resource for me too. That if those laws didn't exist, if feminists didn't put those laws there, you wouldn't even have the language to frame that claim, right? So Flavia um, Agnes, uh, the Indian feminist lawyer, uh, deems that turning to law may be an advantage, right? Uh, she says, the women will be asked for proof, but as the law on sexual harassment at the workplace stipulates clearly, it is not the acts of the abuse, it is not the acts of the abuser, but the perception of the violated that is relevant. So she, you know, she reminds us that um, at the end of the day, it is about not what the accuser thought, despite how much you would see that um, in Indian case law, but um, how the victim felt. So, um, both uh, McKinnon and Flavia, uh, as lawyers, they argue for laws that laws will facilitate changes in behavior or norms that can be arrested now, right? Um, so again, from uh, Flavia Agnes, the lesson learned is that women have to stake a claim. Uh, they will not be given their rights on a platter. They have to snatch them from a patently patriarchal system of corporate governance. But it's possible to dent the structure. It is possible to bring in fresh air. So they, are, they seem very hopeful because they're relying on law. On the other hand, me too fundamentally represents the limitation of law as a space, right? Because we have had laws for um, the limitations of law as a space to redress injuries of gender violence. Uh, so Brenda Kosman, I'll read you a little piece from her, she says, it is the fantastical failure of law that has led to me too. Law has repeatedly refused to recognize harm after harm with acquittals and dismissals of allegations of sexual violence against women. The harm didn't happen because law has the power to define and adjudicate the harm. Me too can be seen as a performance of regulatory failure, as in the failure of the incentive system. So such regulatory failures, un unsurprisingly, line up along the axes of race and class and caste and gender hierarchies. Um, you know, because of the manifest, you know, that because criminal justice outcomes are so unfair, and mass incarceration is so biased by race and class, um, women from in the US from racially minoritized communities or immigrants um, don't find options like prison to be a good solution in their uh, daily situations, right? So um, Me Too activists, uh, such as signatories to the Indian Low Shalist, which I'll talk about more in a second, who identify themselves as marginalized by caste and class, or uh, those, who's, those who created the US shitty media men list, um, also echo a similar betrayal against legal infrastructure. These folks on these lists contend that laws have not helped them because bureaucratic processes have been difficult and perpetrators have had all kinds of imp impunity. So indeed, their accusations are also leveled against those feminists who they contend have emphasize institutional reform, like change the law, change the policy, rather than care for victims, without sufficiently interrogating their own, own um, deep structures of social privilege, and that they have protected abusers who share the social locations. So um, some Me Too accusations seem to have had professional consequences for a few perpetrators, and we all know some stories, right? Um, and the record shows that any anyone who has been successful at that person who has been really fired or gone away, are often those cases that are backed by independent media investigations and um, that have had multiple kind of eerily similar things, right? So those are those cases can go forward. There are many other kinds of cases that don't. 
So, and some institutions have changed some policies, right? But um, still now, the transparency of processes and the uh, robustness of processes are far from clear. So, uh, for if you all might have been following that anthropology as a discipline is like deep in the throes of this problem. Right? But it has become quite clear that the ability to be heard about sexual assault is highly correlated with this uh, the vulnerability of um, the, uh, the the kind of race or class or caste position we occupy and how that's successful, right? So this relationship of uh, feminism to law is at the core of this somewhat generational conflict of Me Too. Um, the difference is centered around how much reliance to place on law or um, punishment. Uh, arguably, both positive and leg uh, negative uh, legal outcomes have added momentum to outrage. So um, again, to use an example from the US, uh, you know, when Bill Cosby now, now or oh, much what has gone under the bridge, Bill Cosby was uh, only one case could go forward, but when he was um, convicted, this whole group rose up in cheers. And then again, with Brett Kavanaugh's case, that uh, um, the fact that he wasn't convicted kind of spurred some moments of me too, right? But feminists who long for the clarity of legal resolution, also, there are also people who say, like Davis, as imperfect as the legal system is, I must admit that I really long for a juridical procedure in fear that men were being blamed and shamed with severe consequences. So, you know, um, uh, in uh, looking at <laughs> the research on men's groups also, there is always this concern, like, is it about, um, is the case going forward with too little? We have not seen that much evidence of it, but people want law to be a place where that's decided, right? where innocence and guilt are decided. In that way. Um, but, uh, you know, when we go that way, we, we forget to notice this legal pluralism point that uh, the very idea of law enables survivors to isolate their need for other kinds of reparative solutions. The law is a vehicle or a language. So what should we hear in these legal cases is survivors' urges to be able to name the processes through which they were violated, the complicities of families, friends, colleagues, and institutions, and a way for perpetrators to fully understand how they wounded, not just bodies, but psyches affecting, uh, how they affected confidence and shame and trust, right? That's the goal, to hear, to hear victims, for perpetrators to understand, to see the process. So I want you to leave you with one example um, by, you know, so this is Larry Nassar, who uh, was this uh, gymnastics coach. Um, in this courtroom trial, he was accused of sexually abusing decades of uh, gymnastic students, convincing them and their families that nothing was going on, that he was within the bounds of medical practice. I, um, uh, there's a very excellent podcast on this called Unbelieved. So uh, one of the things that the judge did remarkably was to show the power of trial and testimony as a space of healing by allowing these women to name, to confront him in the courtroom and name how they felt, right? what they had gone through. So in this, in this courtroom trial, the most remarkable moment of reckoning comes when Nasser breaks down for the first time. Upon hearing one of his friends who had been his primary champion of his cause, um, she describes coming to understand how she too had been a victim of abuse. So in such accounts, we see that legal testimony isn't just about law, guilt or innocence, but it's a space of, you know, discourse, it's a space of discursive excess, right? Where we see the raw effects of the abuse and come to understand it for what it is and what it's in itself. Second, I want to talk uh, more quickly about sex. Um, so the question is, <laughs> is recalibrating norms of sexual interaction and uh, naming an in in Recalibrating uh, norms of sexual interaction and naming unwelcome behaviors, does Me Too become sex negative? Does, is it too conservative? How do we highlight the power to say yes alongside the power to say no? Right? That's the critical question. So, because Me Too calls out a range of behaviors, it may appear to conflate a number of very different behaviors, right? Uh, you know, a comedian who flashes people in his office. Um, kind of aggressive remarks and gazes and touches that are everyday occurrences. Um, but um, include, but 
that has extended into consensual relations and with people feeling queasy about, you know, coarse content that we have that contains references to sex and violence. So uh, I always think about it in terms of how does it challenge strips of sex, you know, to disentangle those two strands. So those who represent the movement as sex negative find it to be tone deaf to the nuances of romance and the energy of sexual exchange. Um, uh, they find me too to be kind of squeamish and conservative. So famously, um, uh, the French actor Catherine Deneuve um, wrote, uh, she and 99 others actually wrote a letter to Le Monde. Um, this is a classic example of this response. <laughs> In here you have a, uh, uh, someone who's responded to their letter. But uh, the, um, you know, she kind of said, oh, you're, you know, squeamish people and, you know, heard this smoking hot star thing made people line up behind this. So these people, these 9,900 people made a case for women's freedom. They attempted to rehabilitate gentlemanly seduction as an art, you know, optimal gender. They said, as women, we do not recognize ourselves in this feminism, which is beyond denouncing the abuse of power. And it takes on a hatred of men and sexuality. Uh, people took people often characterize this as a kind of French process uh, response, but we can you know counter this by saying, uh, you know, the idea that uh, alleged victims should toughen up and they should understand how everything is erotic exchange is you know and the easiest example to deal with that is to think about the ways in which uh, many forms of harassment and rape are forms of domination. They're not even minimally right forms of erotic exchange. So, but a more, you know, a, a critique to pay more attention to a more explicitly fem political feminist stance against sex negativities uh, suggests that sexuality is a zone of risk and play, right, rather than a sacrosanct uh, zone of safety. So Brenda Cosman again uh, makes that argument. She argues that the Me Too era are playing out the 70s sex wars, right, um, around pleasure versus danger. So sex as pleasure, uh, gets underemphasized, sex as danger becomes the most important thing. Right? She sees that Nitu claims that sexual danger for women is everywhere and that sexual harms are real, etc. Um, uh, and she sees that people who critique Me Too for that are not saying that there's no rape or harassment. Rather, those people are pushing back at the idea of sexuality as exclusively a site of danger. Right? Um, so I mean, I, I take that point that we, you know, in all of this discussion, it is not to take away women's, se women's power of sexual subjectivity. Um, and also, like consent, uh, we are beginning to wrestle with the fact that it's a very difficult concept, right? And it's a much more complicated concept than our policy handbooks would um, have us believe. Uh, I mean, there's always this clear and ambiguous and enthusiastic yes, which is not, you know, how. Uh, even consensual relationships, even anything we would consider consensual relationships might end up looking at, right? Um, so it's shaped by interaction or context or something. So um, uh, so folks would say that Janet Haley, for example, uh, has, who has been recently in more trouble, uh, has argued that policies attempting to be progressive often become prescriptive of gender scripts. They inscribe femininity as passive and infantile and sex averse. So that is something for us to look out for, right? Um, and uh, I wanted to just uh, briefly share with you that Ashwini Tambe again uh, reminds us to understand the difference between sexual consent and coercion, right? So there are all kinds of transactional sex, right? That's not the same. So how a person, what power a person occupies in that uh, matters, right? Um, so the another point that I want to make kind of quickly to move on from that uh, is that, you know, laws of sex harassment or sex discrimination always center sex as the focus of regulation, right? So other forms of harassment, other forms of abuse or exclusion do not create a similar weighty apparatus. So in universities, we've had many cases, famously this Columbia professor, Abid al uh, where uh, a student, uh, you know, 
finally the case came forward when the student alleged sexual harassment, right? But there had been a known pattern of abuses on different things uh, that she had already put forward. So, uh, but, you know, uh, that did not rise to the level of the instruments that people can work with. So that is a matter for concern for, for us to uh, attend to. So, um, you know, in, in that case, um, all those non-sex related behaviors could not, were not hearable to grievance processes, right? Unless, until they were hooked to a kind of sex. Um, Rishad Dwati Bargi has a lovely article that, that if, if, about Indian educational systems where she draws attention to this crucial intersectional point that Dalit women's everyday lives in university settings to illustrate how caste and uh, race and class structure interaction and preference, right? How they move through offices, through buildings, through staff rooms, through, you know, exams, etc. So university grievance processes on sexual harassment are often set up through the work of previous feminist generations, right? But those are focused on law and not on noticing the other things, all the other things that do not come under, like, have you had sex or not? Or have you made sexual overtures? Or not? So um, to summarize that section, Me Too is most immediately about unwelcome sexual overtures in the context of work or teaching. But in launching conversations about how sex operates in these realms, it has opened up debates around our complex understandings of power and consent, right? Um, so um, even as Me Too calls out sexual coercion and violence, it wrestles with the difficulty of negotiating what sexual agency is. Finally, I have to talk about feminism. So the topics of law and sex both demonstrate that Me Too is a more contested side of feminist politics than one would ever have imagined, right? I mean, what is there to argue about that? Uh, the contested territory, I, I'm going to frame it in this way. The, con the conflict is this. Is Me Too feminist or is it post-feminist? Is it the next step in an evolutionary narrative of feminist progress that we are done with it? Or is it a move that rejects feminism as privileged and out of reach and seeks to make its own mark in the world? So, um, you know, commonly like Osman, people describe the conflict to generational difference, but perhaps we might better parse it not as a generational difference, as different approaches to gender-based violence. Um, and here the difference is that one of the groups wants to think about women as a category, and the other group wants to think about it as a fundamentally intersectional question that considers uh, class, caste, and race in the mix. So, um, and that the main movement is basically about the tensions of those two approaches. So, uh, many, and you know, enthusiastic feminist voices fold Me Too into this long arc of resistance, as I said, you know, as uh, to just reiterate what. Uh, uh, McKinnon said she uses this evocative uh, uh, image of butterflies. I won't read the whole thing to you, but you can see her enthusiasm. In it, right? um, it's, a it's a revolution, you know, it's a women's revolution. So in here she sees women as a unified category. Now, you know, many people, including me, um, find that to be uh, a, a difficult thing to uh, live with, right? Considering what different circumstances different women can be, or who is to be counted as a woman. So, uh, McKinnon, you know, is uh, very enthusiastic for legal change for women as a group. But another way to think about the US history of B2 is to ask how old it is. So, people have said, is it part of just that legal change in the 60s and 70s, or do you see it as a longer history of resistance? Is it part of you know, long fraught incomplete histories of women's resistance, including formal and informal protests. Um, so several people have made a case for um, black women's, African American women's uh, resistance through the ages as, a, as also an iteration of uh, B2, right? And for us, we too can imagine what our scenario of that is, right? It's not just the move, uh, women's movement led my middle class women in India, but also others who have been part of struggles over time. So, um, uh, and then various people have talked about it as a form of res globally formed different forms of resistance. Um, the newest step in Egyptian women's fight against treating up in a certain way. It's a breaking point of generations of complaints by, you know, Indian students, the workers, small town journalists, NGO workers, etc. But a significant motive 
in Me Too is the calling out of feminists, right? Even surpassing the calling out of perpetrators. The uh, folks who are not feminists in India told me that there were more there were more critiques of feminists out there than there were critiques of perpetrators. I think the same was true of Facebook. Um, so this generation, I mean, the media loves to think of it as a generational cat fight, right? But they don't quite understand the kind of territorial tension, right? Who can lay claim to the term feminist when uh, you consider race a caste and how can you use the word women in that, cat in that scheme? So um, the Indian version is of a middle class, upper caste domination, right, of the terrain of feminism. So the Indian case, this is, uh, sort of we're ending on the last example, perfectly illustrates feminist dynamics around the axes of gender and caste, right? In brief, Me Too uh, 1.0 um, started with, you know, 2.0, as you know, was in a way more broad based. But 1.0 started with the students' um, initially private social media list of Indian academics, now popularly called Lusha. Uh, it emerged at the same time as web lists like Shruti Media Men elsewhere. So she was reprimanded by established feminist um, academics through a letter on Indeed on Kapila, administered by one of the authors of that uh, letter, for offering up a rumor network rather than relying on institutional due process, rely on law, for ignoring the long history of feminist institution building and support for survivors. Supporters of the list responded with a critique that foregrounded the caste privilege of the letter writers, the accusation being that these largely upper caste feminists were shoring up their own privileges. They were protecting male allies of their caste and class who loom large on their list, and they were refusing to hear how feminist institutions had failed vulnerable subjects. So the distrust of law here extends to feminists as co-conspirators in systems of privilege, right? In which feminists are cast as a homogeneous group in a way that erases their arguments and debates. So Pratiksha Pachi has some work on it saying, it's the feminists get blamed for bureaucratic processes going wrong, which without particularly getting credit for all the complications that they had brought to the debate, or that they had they had named, you know, all of these potential challenges that has somehow got lost along the way. Um, and law was only the proximate argument, right? Um, Chada talks about the trip uh, between the groups as deeply emotional. Uh, she says, while the older feminists, the signatories of the Kafila statement, communicated rage and hurt at being discredited and dismissed as mothers in law, some of the list makers felt that they were losing their feminist heroes and were being left to fend for themselves. This sense of loss was compounded by the fact that we were also losing our male allies. The sense of betrayal, hurt, and anger seems to be quite real and raw on both sides. So supporters of law, uh, Losha wanted to look beyond law to the silent structural hegemonies of liberalism, like everyday processes of you know, exclusion in jobs and schools. Um, so many were concerned that you know, social media was only about celebrity. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, lots of people thought that the media was all about highlighting celebrities. But there were other groups, like uh, Speak Out in Kerala, which sought out social media for its democratizing effects. Right? So Speak Out argued that it could, media could be a powerful vehicle for uh, Dalit, Bahujan, Adivasi women to speak out against upper caste or inter-community violence by men in ways that legal process would not allow them to. So social media gave them that empowering space. But, uh, you know, in other reckonings, Me Too is a significant moment of also forging feminist community anew. And uh, here I wanted to bring you Kalpana Kanabiran's excellent essay. Those of you who have not read it immediately do so. Uh, saying we too in the footsteps of Havari Devi. She talks about these events I mentioned as momentous in feminist politics, right? Uh, and let you read Katna's words. Um, she talks about the ways in which it has called out feminist politics as in a graded society. Um, she centers her um, analysis on Bhavari Devi, right, who uh, I'm sure most of you know, was a rural social worker in Rajasthan uh, who was gang raped for in retaliation for her work on child marriage. So her rapists were never convicted despite this very clear case. But her case went to, I mean, Bhavari Devi still comes around to many of these spaces asking what happened to justice, right? But her case, as you know, has gone on to form the very basis of sexual harassment law in the country. Um, 
<clears throat> and it's thus become more, more useful to urban and middle class women, right? So here, uh, here is Kalpana's thing on this, that with Bhavari we see the different simultaneous locations of the mean defined by the specific P, right? To Bhavari it's inclusive at times, community, village, feminist collective, right? Who she appeals to, or exclusionary. With the me standing alone at the margin, speaking truth to power, losing ground to multiple channels, right? Um, so I'll just read the last line. She says, in her self-conscious choices, talking about how I think, she as a survivor with feminist agency transforms the me into a plural we constituted outside the frames of individual revolution of redress. So how to build that thing, right? So <clears throat> Kanabiran defines feminism through a genealogy that emphasizes the failures and resistances of marginalized women. She highlights the forgotten futility and bravery in collective protests, um, calling for politics that is accountable to forms of harm against individuals, as well as for forging alliances that recognize um, these contexts to folks such as Marita. Our essay imagines multitudes within feminism without losing sight of power. So let me just say very briefly in conclusion, uh, where did we locate ourselves when we chimed in to meet true? We had these overlapping ribbles and eddies of this movement or this movement located in and around law, transferred in whispers on social media. Uh, it was wary of sex as power or impatient with sex as fear, jubilant or suspicious or feminism as community. So Me Too, I think, reveals for, at the end of the day, reveals a profound unhappiness of the rules of sex and harassment at play and the will, the will to disrupt rules through widespread and shouted stories. So it's a phenomenon that amplifies the conflicts of law, the conflicts of how we think about sex and how we talk about feminism, but it also contains the potential to be a space for listening across differences and reimagining genealogies. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much. Um whoever is left um, um, like I said uh, as expected of can you very thought provoking um, um, yes uh, am, am I audible am I audible yeah okay uh, you're audible but not visible <laughs> yeah no yeah I can see her. Oh. I can't see her. <laughs> I okay. the, the no, I'm invisible. Okay. Okay. <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> as long as uh, I can. So think about uh, now uh, now uh, uh, certain, 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 um, certain aspects that uh, uh, that that the movement that me to uh, as a movement uh, um, sort of brought to the forefront, uh, and th this is also one of one of those. Um, this was one of those this you know sites or, or or phases that brought many of us including myself to this very difficult position of aligning between collective uh you know voice between a collective voice and individual uh, an individual uh, you know location an individual location, not just location, geographical location. That is that that has movement is concerned, but also as as far as, for example, uh, when when I was uh, listening to uh, Professor Basu, I I was thinking of where I where 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 I was located when when this sort of when when Me Too happened, and I was. Um, in retrospect, I think a very, in, a, in a very sort of a, you know scary position of uh, having to uh, chair the internal complaints committee of the center. And I had um, uh, and and I had 
uh, as a faculty of gender studies at the center in 2016. You know, uh, face in the gender studies circle, so to say. And um, so, uh, and in a, and then in a place like center, and suddenly in, in like, a couple of months time i i was I, I saw myself as chairing this extremely scary space called um, the internal complaints committee or the, or the mechanism that we have coxash at, at the center and there goes me too and there i am so on you know there and just keeping myself updated as to what is happening who are being named etc and 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 very 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 excited that such a and, and like like Professor Basu mentioned in the very beginning that it's just it's it's nothing just a pervasive harassment which is being given a voice. Uh, it's 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 nothing new and it's it's not it's not uh, it's not like uh, we 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 didn't know that things happen. We have all been through some kind of experiences at some point in 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 our lives. But it's just what Me Too did was br brought this sort of invisibilized, um, uh, pervasive harassment. It, it just gave it a voice. So I, from my point, from, from my location, I was already excited. But at the same time, I was um, in academics, a gender studies person, where I'm also having to not just not not let myself be just you know uh, being 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 just blown away by the by the by the frenzy however i might want to be like this and uh, or um uh, instances where where i did have to where i did have to um answer i i i i i had to answer uh, either in defense or as at least as someone who is heading a legal mechanism and this is what uh, very 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 um um clearly came out in Professor Basu's talk is what happens when social fault lines, as, as, as the expression that you use, social fault lines clash with or, or meet law. So as, as someone who was sitting there wanting to be a part of this global phenomena but at the same time constantly having to remind myself that the, constantly having to give myself a reality check that today i i can write i can speak a lot about the whole me too movement and and how the, the feminist politics of it etc all of that but at the same time tomorrow when i'm having to actually uh, look at or handle a case of uh, uh, one of say one of my colleagues having been named in the list and people expecting me as someone leading a, a committee a legal mechanism to actually act how do i you know balance this these two so it is that movement which again brings to the fourth the question, the very difficult question of what happens when movements and law meet. How does, how, how do, um, you know, social emotions translate into law? And which, 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 which is a, which, which, which is a, which is a question which I, I don't think there is, there is a very, of course, there is, there is no easy answer. Uh, there is there is no answer at all. I think. I mean, how does one uh, translate social emotions into uh, law? Um, the the other um, uh, 
I think what 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 also in, uh, came out in, in in the talk and again something that 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 uh, me as someone trying to um, uh, trying to think a bit about the whole gender law uh, issue is that constantly if 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 um, if 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 such if, if such movements especially if feminist legal legal reforms if, if 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 somehow not not if i mean what 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 i find problematic is if if it constantly it it somehow uh, 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 turns out to be to 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 center upon a punitive approach of you know one one half of the population constantly trying to bring the other half to 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 answer and to punishment and then it becomes a circle that there is always a backlash uh which you have seen with and which you have uh, uh, talked about a lot in 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 um in men men rights movement cases that, that is constantly a tendency of a backlash and so that becomes a Uh, Devdutta, you're breaking up a bunch, huh? Do you want to try turn? I mean, I know it's awkward to not be seen. Do you just want to turn off your microphone while you're talking? Yeah, yeah that, uh, that you can try. Just uh, switch off your camera. The connection will be much better, I think. So. Devdutta, can you hear? I think she has lost her connection. Lost her. Yeah. Yes. 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 She's yes, back. back. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Mm. Uh, you I can. Have. You can. Uh, uh, just. Uh, uh, I lost connection. Camera uh, and just talk. Yeah. Yeah. I'll. I'll do that. Yeah. So. Uh, so then that again brings us to the question that, uh, wh who who brings the change. Does social movements bring legal reforms, or do legal reforms bring about changes in 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 um, you know in, in 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 mentality? So, which which comes first, the 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 hen or the egg? That kind of a question constantly um, keeps uh, recurring when one looks at the legacies of um, uh, you know legal reforms and feminist legal reforms. Uh, the other question that also that again me too and and like 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 uh, many of the other uh, many of the earlier uh, movements have brought to the forefront and again something that uh, Professor Basu has has sort of uh, talked about in, in in some of her earlier works is that there is and 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 here also I know uh, we, we we many of us have actually been in the context of the Me Too movement in some place where people we personally know people we will have difficulty in uh in in agreeing in accepting as perpetrators um uh, have 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 been in that position where we also know people we also know the pervasive kind of harassment that takes place the truth of most of the accusations but at the same time we also know personally know people who um I don't know. I mean, who, 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 let's just say, very, very difficult for us to 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 accept um, as someone who could be a perpetrator, and 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 in some cases where we do see the question of a personal vendetta, uh, where which which again um, which has which has been a major issue with uh, the 498A um, uh, law that uh, you know that it's it's just just a personal sort of vendetta that 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 some of the some of the um, um some, some of the people who have uh called out names might have in mind instead of 
instead of um, a, a, a real issue. I don't know what what a real issue. How how does one decide what a what reality is again and 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 what actually happened? But the very fact that I mean this is this 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 comes a lot from my own complicated position in the context of the whole Me Too movement, where I was stuck in in this position, where I was having to answer whoever, a, a friend, a relative, a colleague, who I know might have been wrongly accused. But at the same time, I am also, I also see myself as part of uh, the larger movement. So how much, um, how much um, uh, you know, solidarity to show for the, for the movement? It's easier to show solidarity for a movement where again, and, and something that 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 you mentioned, where one is not, one does not have a have a probably a uh, a personal experience in, but it's it's probably slightly more difficult, more complex, to be part of uh, uh, an an emotion, a movement, where my where my my where my own ones in terms of you know friends or colleagues or relatives whoever etc who who I, I have quote unquote trust in are are also uh, you know um, accused of such uh, uh, such uh, perpetration so that's that's a very and 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 I and I'm sure the Me Too movement brought many of us at this very difficult you know position of having to deal with a collective voice and personal uh, positions, personal political positions, personal social positions, personal familial positions. Um, and and uh, the other important thing to, to think about and, and something Professor Basu pushed uh, to is, again, what, what is the legacy of uh, Me Too movement? What after Me Too movement, and how how I mean, of course the 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 major the 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 major cases which have turned out to be proper legal cases and which go on that's keeping track of them and seeing where where they go that's that's uh, certainly one one part of the 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 afterlife of Me Too, but as as a as a everyday afterlife of Me Too I think. This uh, it has given it, it. It has pushed, and again, like many of the previous uh, legal reforms, a, a, a backlash of sexism regarding the Me Too movement itself. The way now Me Too is the Me Too movement, and the the, the idea of the Me Too movement is invoked in say gatherings in in informal gatherings in among friends etc uh, just casually uh, um you know uh, casually mentioning me too as uh, as as a probable outcome of uh, of 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 something that a friend or a, or a colleague or or, or someone uh, you know, um, is is trying to pursue and and what you what you called as sex as pleasure and sex as danger. So the whole idea of sex as danger uh, is invoked in a very very again in a, in a very sexist, superficial, fun kind of uh, invocation in 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 informal gatherings. And and we we again, I, I'm sure many of us have been part of such gatherings where where just casually uh, someone says uh, be careful there can be a me too against you anytime and the and and then the whole group um, laughs at the at this uh, you know at this um, this this use of the idea of uh, me too uh, and of course uh, um, as 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 uh, it it and where where I sort of uh, where we started our uh, this uh, session with is that me too brought brought along again the the uh, most of us 
especially people uh, who are trying to make sense of this very uh, strange and complex connection between society and law, um, the, the, the question of um, the delusion of alliance and betrayal, uh, where, where um, you know, and, and, and that is something that uh, Professor Basu ended her talk with is the, the way, uh, the, the kind of response that feminist uh, groups, uh, feminist scholars had to two very different sort of response, two very kind, two very different kinds of responses that uh, uh, feminist scholars and activists and feminist groups has had towards uh, once the the list was out, um, as as one one part as a critique of a list and 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 calling out names and um, shaming, uh, public shaming, and the other as um the need for it and the and the and, and questions of um you know a privileged feminism and privileged position of feminists who can actually um uh, critique something uh, like uh, me too so that again uh brought to the for the extremely heterogeneous complex um you know, conflicting site that feminism and feminist activism and feminist scholarship is, uh, and 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 something that uh, one needs to uh, take note of in, and especially in the context of trying to understand uh, this entanglement between uh, law and society and gender. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be questions uh, uh, which uh, we will take now. Thank you, Professor Basu. I, I can't thank you enough for, you know, bringing the whole, all, all of this together, all these very, uh, you know, scattered thoughts that many of us had for years, especially people who 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 found themselves at at at, at this very difficult crossroad of of the. Of 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 a individual position and a collective position. Um, thank you again, and we will now, I think, uh, take questions if there are any. Yes, uh, there's a question in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, could she uh, read out? Uh, could she uh, address the question directly to Srimoti? Uh, I think it's by the question is by. Tapushini uh, Mitro. Yeah. Yes. Tapushini, could you unmute yourself and uh, speak? Um, yes, okay. Uh, so I'll just read the question out that I have typed out. Uh, so this was a very enlightening talk, and thank you for that. Uh, I was thinking about the way the Me Too movement has arrived in academia and how much resistance it has faced from many established feminist academics, uh, like we have seen in uh, the cases in NYU and Harvard also, mm -hmm. uh, while they stood by the perpetrators. So as young scholars, it becomes very difficult to even have a conversation about these issues in uh, these very hostile spaces. So how do we navigate these complicated territories in our own works or in our ped pedagogy while we are teaching uh, students? Yeah. I've been actually the opportunity for days. So very lovely to hear from her. And thank you, uh, uh, Devdutta, for uh, very, uh, I think you framed or you touched on several important kind of issues there. Um, but I was also struck by, you know, both, both of your comments on how, you know, I, mean, you, I was thinking about that as well. You saw that. Um, it's kind of impossible for any of us to not be um, kind of deeply personal about this, right? So uh, to that end, I don't, um, I don't have the answer for you, I, but I know. I know of what you speak, that people are, you know, these are, uh, many of these are people who I, you know, come to my friends and allies. Um, and... Uh, it's like a reckoning of identity, you know? So I think I would say that um, 
the students I had at the time or I have since. We just have to kind of continue to talk about it and continue to discuss what the issues are that plague us on it. And so, um, to, I didn't say much about this when we were talking, but you know, anthropology is in that moment, in that very moment of crisis. Right? So, um, so this began at Harvard. Uh, with, uh, um, I mean, Komarov has had discussions against him for years, right? So now there's this kind of process, right? Um, but, you know, the, the crisis is not just like, okay, put John Komarov on disciplinary leave, right? The crisis is how in anthropology to be distributed, who, who do the funds go to? You know, how do, I mean, that's who, how, what is the mentoring process? What is the fieldwork process? What is the access to? You know what are the repercussions upon people so that seems to me like really um i mean the same i mean you know it was talking about the committee but it's also all about all our courses all our academia so it seems really crucial to not avoid these conversations anybody else Thoughts on Oli. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Sri uh, for uh, for a brilliant uh, brainstorming uh, lecture. I was just wondering whether the Me Too movement had any impact on the our existing laws. I mean, the laws regarding sexual harassment in India. Uh, because uh, the uh, the Sexual Harassment in Workplace Act has stipulated that the complainant uh, has to be uh, the the aggrieved woman has to complain within a period of three months from the date of the incident, and in case of a series of incidents, within a period of three months from the date of the last incident. But but uh, the, the the people who called out, uh, I mean, the uh, called out, uh, I mean, who brought brought allegations against uh, perpetrators uh, in this Me Too movement. They've often talked about incidents that happened years back and often decades back. So, uh, I mean, uh, and that often, uh, I mean, that has also triggered a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, skepticism. Uh, why, did they, why did these women keep mum all these years? Okay. Uh, why did they suddenly start speaking? Was, was, was there a personal agenda? Behind their allegations, uh, but uh, I think that uh, that uh, the three months time stipulated by our law is too small a period. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, for for a woman to to uh, to gather that uh, mental uh, kind of uh, uh, mental uh, uh, not not uh, kind of mental. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you need a, a you need to to be out of your trauma to speak out. I think, uh, isn't it? I mean, if you are too traumatized, uh, you can't speak out. So uh, they need to come out of the trauma to speak out. And three months is to, is too small a time period for a, a victim uh, or a survivor or a, a sexual harassment survivor to overcome her trauma and speak out in public. I mean, uh, I personally, personally feel that uh, women should be given more time uh, in this regard. But uh, the Me Too uh, camp, uh, campaign, uh, uh, even though it is a, it, 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 this campaign is happening in the social media, an extra legal space, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this, this has given women the opportunity to speak out Years after uh, the, 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 they suffered, they become uh, they they uh, became victimized. Okay, so uh, what is your take on that personally? And again, uh, the personal uh, memories uh, keep coming in. Um, I, I'm personally reminded of an incident that happened to me when I was a child, and I I have not shared. Uh, my uh, my trauma with uh, with my family members, but recently I have written um, two uh, chapters of my autobiography. I mean, uh, I should not say autobiography, but I've tried to uh, sh share with a wider with a wider reader.
it in public uh, my own experiences of discrimination and sexual harassment but again i could not name the person because he uh, he is uh, a close relative of mine i uh, i mentioned the event so uh, i mean i understand that it needs a lot of courage a lot of uh, kind of uh, mental strength to name a person okay so uh, and um, anonymity is not uh, not something which neither uh, is not is something which neither the law encourages nor the me to uh, movement encourages but all of us have a little little secrets to share little experience little, not little very severe experiences of uh sexual harassment to share i am mean, i think so uh, okay. i mean you know, i will i will just add uh, yeah. one small thing to open up these uh, thing uh, when you talk about the the, the law and changes to law um, this uh, period of 3 months being problematic the other very problematic thing about um uh, sexual harassment uh, laws laws against sexual harassment has to do with evidence i yes. mean uh, how, yes, how, right. do, how do you gather evidence and uh, as right. a yes so as again as someone who uh, when when i say when we say what how how do you prove when where do you have witnesses of say a student facing harassment maybe mental harassment not mm. even sexual harassment yes mentally yes. because 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 you see that power position working very neatly there mm. because mm -hmm. the students is at the hands of the professor so then so when i talk about the whole process of how mm. this you know complaints mechanism works and i talk to students and i talk about evidence and i and i mostly find myself talking very you know things that that, that don't make sense to me i mean if you feel harassed if you feel abused if you are actually abused how do you gather evidence you are only absolutely in the room so yes, you you absolutely. then immediately you are expected to immediately if there is no other witness there is no one else in the room they they are encouraged to take a friend with you every time you go to a professor's room which is very weird or you immediately go out talk about your experience about uh, to a friend so that later you can bring mm. a friend or whoever mm. to to your uh, as 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 a sort of witness or you go and write it out so that later when you if you if you think you you will complain so that acts as a so this whole idea of evidence and this is not just in 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 matters of the you know sexual harassment at workplace or higher education or the sexual harassment laws in general but also you know evidence is something that we 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 mm. push to think about in 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 you know in rape, rape laws okay. any kind Absolutely. of gender based violence you know to to yes. gather evidence yeah so yes. i mean i i think uh, what, what is the idea that you should go see a professor in pairs is just so infantilizing and you know just so you know like once again it sets up different sort of subjectivity for what for you know a, a, a woman student is a chaperone you know um you know something very but in this idea of statute of limitation on this right i don't know what the i think it comes from the idea that people have as you know on that list a brought up cases that were filed 20 years ago but you know when students have a case it's very clear that there is a criminal process right so why is it even one episode your evidence is actually strong in the course of the thing mm. so that seems to be you know and i mean that's what i'm trying to grapple with right so the person has to do that manufacture whatever evidence right you know make themselves a walking on type of evidence the whole time um for what right what they want is the department's policies you know like that so so <laughs> um So the two things that they avoid or the dissatisfaction should happen on different sorts of registers somehow, because as you can see, those two things that you name is about narrowing the process to more legalistic and have you know to have um, less trouble for the committee, right? what oporna says uh, about uh, her own experience within the family that's a very common thing the family uh, 
uh, yeah. this nice. happens within family and family members they, uh, keep aloof they can just keep uh, not knowing anything as if it just uh, hasn't ha happened at all so uh, this is uh, uh, this movement i think will uh, to some extent uh, upon a please mute your mic Yeah. Uh, to some extent, the consciousness uh, it will give rise to uh, consciousness that things uh, must not be taken for granted. Uh, But you know, I, I mean, I I, uh, I don't understand why you would protect that family. Why are we protecting the family member who's you know? is not deserving of that protection and so one of the things that i i mean i one of the things that's really been upsetting to me over the years in in kolkata among our families and friends is that when we had a case you know of someone who has come forward against a prominent family member uh, she's taken the courage to talk about it and no one among our other relatives or friends could Take, you know, could ever look at it? Could ever talk about it? Could exactly, you know? Exactly that I'm saying. We yeah. could all exist in some fancy, you know, like you know, it's like what is that movie? Mira Nair, Monsoon Wedding. You know? Yes, Monsoon. That doesn't happen, right? Where people are like, oh yes, I hear you. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I hear your pain. That doesn't happen. So I, so I guess I, I think, don't I protect them. But I. I, I also something that again that that you mentioned is that this is where also i think somewhere uh, why law is important because it's also about law giving us a word for our experience it takes time for someone say someone who's faced something like this in at childhood did not have the words to frame exactly. her experience exactly. so now after after say 10 years or 20 years i know what consent is Right. I know what what is harassment. Right. I know uh, uh, an, an uncle forcibly making me sit on his lap and kissing me is harassment. And I would need one age age as an experience, mm -hmm. and more more importantly, the, these words, which again, ironically, the words the, the law you know gives us the whole idea. No, of but agency just even a yeah. I mean, I was going to say even a notion of agency over your body. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly, exactly. That is the yeah. Okay. And the other okay. problem is in, uh, in colleges. Uh, I don't know whether uh, about the universities. The main problem when uh, somebody makes a complaint to ICC, Internal Complaints Committee, the uh, constitution of the committee. What should be the constitution of the committee? Who should be the members? Whether the uh, governing body members could be a member of this constitution committee because there may be personal vendetta also, so uh, it's not clear. And recently there have been a case in my college, and the high court uh, gave a rule uh, to uh, specifically uh, mention the constitution of ICC regarding uh, colleges. and universities who should be the member of those committees who can be who can be not exactly what should be the nature of the committee and that is very important because yeah. um, uh, because uh, sometimes situations arises uh, when you are uh, what uh -huh. you know colleges are too small you cannot have just nobody who knows anybody who will recuse themselves right, right? right yeah you know right. that would be the ideal situation no one should know anybody even then even then right yeah So, yeah, and research, to... research institutes are even smaller places. Yes. <laughs> so there, it's, it's like five, five minutes by the way. It's very difficult. Yeah. Uh, and and, and making constituting ICCs and leading them can be absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> the moment you say a word, a punctuation, everybody knows what what is happening, what has happened, and. Who are we talking about? So right. it's, it's so. Uh, is there any other question? In, in in smaller institutions, ICC can be a farce actually. Yeah, yeah basically, it's true. All right, I think we should let folks off to their Saturday nights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Ashutia and Abhinav. Huh?
wish we could have all met somewhere maybe just to let बुक लॉन्च ऑन दी सेवन एस इज इन ऑनर ऑफ जेरल Paul Hello. Jerry, <laughs> the the book has officially been released by the publisher, but is yet to be uh, I mean, right. to, yet to come to I the market. I mean, list. only a few copies of were, were printed, and uh, but we are so, planning a formal release on the twenty seventh. We'll definitely invite you all. Please be there. Okay. So and thank you. My computer is going to lose its juice in two seconds. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shrimati Di. No, and thank you, Dev Dutta. And thank you thank all you, for you. being with us today. And Harushoti for recording yeah, for this uh, for recording session. Thing, yeah. <laughs> it will be. It will get live in Facebook. Uh, who are interested can see. later on also uh, not live one the recorded version will the be uploaded on facebook and also will be available on youtube right, right, right. okay okay thank you so much thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you okay bye bye yes